be a blessing to all of our children ages 5 to 12, amen, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We said it that early because in Texas around this time, you either beat the heat or you wait for it to go back in. It's one of the two. We either, we either go in 9 to 12, or we're going to have it from 6 to 9 at night. <laughs> you, got, you got two options <laughs> because in the middle of the day, it really has been, been hot here. But we're going to believe God for good, uh, good weather and a and good opportunity. Our kids, amen, we want to be a blessing to them. So we've been preparing, and thank you for all of those who have volunteered and signed up to be a part of uh, this event. So that's this coming Saturday from 9 to 12. We're going to have a... We're gonna have events inside. We're going to do things outside. We just want to be a blessing to our kids uh, that morning. So that is all of our announcements that we have for this morning. Um, we're going to, i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give at the end. Can we do that this morning? We're going to do our giving at the end. I want to get right into this message this morning. Uh, I feel compelled to, to get moving with it. And so I want you to turn to Proverbs or, or your, your iPads or whatever you use Proverbs, find it, 29 and 25. If you're listening to us this morning uh, by way of live stream, if you're joining us from anywhere other than Texarkana as a member of Christ Nation's Church, uh, we welcome you, and we realize that you could have chosen to watch or follow anybody else, but you chose us, and for that we are grateful and thankful, and we pray that the ministry that will go forward this morning will be a blessing to you. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 29 and 25 is our foundation text. Um, we've been on the subject of overcoming the fear of man, overcoming the fear of man or dealing with the fear of people because we realize that this is a big deal, this is a big issue for us, and if we do not overcome this one, uh, we will find that in our lives we'll struggle with a whole lot of different things. And this morning, the Spirit of God has given me the last... Um, I believe the last part of this that I want to minister this morning, and you won't believe it, but I only have two points. Everybody say two points. He's got two points. Now, before you get too happy because you think that means that you're just uh, in two points, I'm out of here. These are two big points, two really big points. And the only reason there are two is because I wanted to be as concise as possible, as exact as possible as to what the Spirit of God wanted me to share with you and minister to you. And he gave me two things to cover. And once we cover those two things as he has laid out to me, we're going to be done. Amen? But let's look at our foundation text. And it reads so profoundly, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Now, notice that verse says, the fear of man brings a snare. Now, that word snare in the Hebrew language, it means a noose, or uh, the actual Hebrews, when they would use the word that is translated here, they would use it also when it, as it pertained to putting a ring in a, in a, in a horse or a, a cow or an ox's nose to pull it. And so it's talking about being snared or entrapped by something. We talked about last time I was up here, it was living life on the hook, right? You know, when you, when you hook that fish, that fish, when that, hook, that fish is on the hook, you now have accomplished control of that fish, and you can use it and turn it and, and bring it into the boat however you like. And so when the Scripture is talking about the fear of man brings a snare, it's saying that when we fear people, when we live with this anxiety and concern for others too much, when we have too much of a fear of man, it creates a snare in our lives. It keeps us bound. It keeps us from being able to be what we're called to be, what we're supposed to do. And I would venture to say it is the biggest issue in the life of most people. They can't seem to move beyond people. They can't seem to get out of the snare of always being concerned and worried about people. Now, how many of you know God is greater than people? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Anything God tells to you, says to you, is greater than anything a person can say to you or do to you. But for us, we seem to have a very heavy concern and anxiety when it comes to people. So this morning, we're going to deal with two snares. The Bible says it brings a snare, so we're going to deal with two snares that tremendously affect our lives. So if you're going to live in fear of people, 
These are two things that the enemy will try to work in your life. Consequently, if you break your fear and your anxiety of people, you will walk free of these snares and be able to live out the fullness of who God created you to be. Say this after me. Say, I want to live out the fullness of God's plan for my life. Amen. 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 Exodus chapter 32, I want you to find it. Exodus 32 is going to give us our first snare that we deal with when it comes to the fear of man. Thank you, Lord, for utterance in the Spirit. Exodus 32 and 4 records a story that we're kind of picking up in the middle uh, and just before we start reading verses 1 through 4, let me give you a little bit of backdrop here. This is Moses right now is up in the mountain communing with God. God is giving Moses the, the law. He is showing him the Ten Commandments. And so he's been away from the children of Israel, the congregation of Israel, all of these people, this massive uh, nation of people. They're down at the bottom of the mountain, and Moses is up in the mountain. And the only person left down there in terms of leadership is Aaron. All right? So this is how we pick up the story <laughs> in chapter 32, verse 1. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up. One translation says, get up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not or don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them in their at their hand or from them and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be the gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Wow. Wow. <laughs> So here is the children of Israel in a bit of a dilemma because Moses is taking too long. He's up in the mountain seeking the face of God, and God is communing with him, giving him the law, but he's taking just a little too long. Now, we could preach a whole message on what we do when we're tired of waiting. We could preach a whole message of the snares and traps that we get into when we're tired of waiting. But this is not a message on overcoming being tired of waiting. This is a message on overcoming the fear of man. And so while we could cover this message from that perspective and be well within scriptural uh, truth to do so, there is another truth that emerges from this that God wants us to see as well. And it is from the perspective of Aaron. Because Aaron here is in front of the congregation. And evidently Aaron is waiting with the rest of the children of Israel. And the children of Israel are getting antsy, getting impatient, they're getting upset because they say this man Moses, they don't even know him. They're not too acquainted with him. You have to understand, they've been in 400 years of Egyptian bondage. They've got piercings everywhere, as the Scripture says. They're boys, they're girls, they're white. Everybody's got all these piercings, and they, they've, been, they've been immersed in Egyptian culture. They've been Egyptian slaves. And this man named Moses shows up, signs, wonders, miracles, and brings them out into the wilderness. And so now that this man Moses is seeking God for the next step of what to do with the children of Israel, they're getting antsy. So they revert back to what they know. Now, what do Egyptian slaves know? They know the polytheism and the idolatry of Egypt. 
So because that's what they know, and they don't know Moses, and they don't know Jehovah. They don't know him yet. They're unaccustomed to him. He's brought them out. He's introduced himself to them through the ministry of Moses, their deliverer, but they don't know him. They don't know God. And so God is, is up there talking to Moses so that he can bring down the law so that they can further know him. Right? We forget that God is dealing with the people that don't know him. Even though they're the seed of Abraham, they don't know the God of Abraham. And so here is Aaron in the middle of this dilemma. And they come to him and they say, get up <laughs> and make us gods because we don't know what Moses is doing and he's taking too long. And Aaron does what he knows he shouldn't. Now, while the children of Israel only know idolatry and polytheism and they only know Egyptian uh, idolatry, Aaron has been more acquainted with Jehovah. He's a little closer. He knows better. He knows he has no business making any type of idols, but the pressure of the people is too great. And because Aaron fears man, it brings the snare of compromise. Everybody say compromise. One of the great works of the fear of man in our lives is that it causes us to compromise. Say that again. Say compromise. It's not a curse word. It's not a good word necessarily all the time, but it's not a bad word. So Aaron compromises and he caves on his loyalty to the truth. He knows Jehovah is God. He knows Moses is his deliverer. He's working hand in hand with Moses. But Aaron here compromises because the pressure from the consensus of the people is too great. And rather than stand his ground and say, no, we know that Jehovah brought us out. He is the true and living God. We know this. I don't care what you guys want. I don't care what you're used to. We're not doing it. Instead of standing his ground, he caves because of the fear of men. Peter, New Testament, I mentioned him earlier. Peter knows Jesus is Lord, and he knows he's also a disciple of Jesus. He is the one, after all, that stands up and sticks his churchy chest out and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> right? He's one of the ones that when he says, if you, if, are you guys going to leave me like the rest? He says, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He is the one who says, oh, be it far from you, Jesus, that you should be crucified. He's the one Jesus has to rebuke and say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you don't savor the things of God but of man. So Peter is thoroughly invested in the exclusivity of Jesus. He believes he is the Christ. He knows he is the Lord, and he is a disciple of his. And he's followed him faithfully three and a half years, through ups and downs, through persecution, prosecution, but on the time in which Jesus is being persecuted and he's going from judgment hall to judgment hall, a little damsel finds him in the crowd, and she sees his face, and she says, aren't you one of his followers? And he says, no, I'm not. Because in that moment, his fear of man causes him to turn his back on previous loyalty to the truth of who he was and who Jesus was. Why do we compromise? Compromise is always, and I repeat, always for self-interest. Nobody ever compromises for somebody else. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about relationships. I'm not talking about compromising in a home. I'm talking about when it comes to truth. 
righteousness, what is right, what is true, what you should do, what is God's word, God's way. We only compromise in those issues for self-interest. There's either something we want to gain or there's something we want to preserve. So we tend to hedge whenever we're faced with an issue that threatens our preservation. Or I could get something. I could get something. I know what I said, but I could get something. I know what I believe, but I could gain something. And so whenever there's something to gain or to preserve of yourself, you are tempted to compromise. And when we have this concern of men, this is what we do. But there's a problem with compromising. There's an issue with it. Because whatever you compromise to gain, you will lose. Whatever I compromise to gain in the immediate, the present, the right now, I, 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 I got it. When I compromised, I got it. I got the money. I got this. I got that, the opportunity. But over the long term, eventually, you will lose it. <laughs> what happened to Aaron? He had the high priesthood, the priesthood stripped from him. What happened to Peter? Oh, my God. Peter's naked on a boat fishing. He's, he, <laughs> all of the self-preservation that he tried to have, he didn't get. He ended up ostracized, and they had to go find Peter and, and get Peter out of a depression. Because whatever you compromise to gain or preserve, you end up losing anyway. You see, the blessing is not in compromising. It's in standing your ground. Hallelujah. Mm. Let's look at a couple of things here. Compromise begins with rationalization. When you begin to rationalize things. Whenever you begin to hear in your head some different iteration of the phrase that Eve heard in her head in Genesis 3, half God said. Has God really said? It sounds a little different in our day and age. It sounds more like everybody's doing this now. It sounds a lot like no one does that anymore. It sounds a whole lot like I'm evolving. You hear that all the time nowadays, people, people evolving, constantly evolving. What are we doing? We are rationalizing previously held truth. We're rationalizing, we're, we're thinking about, I'm evolving on that particular subject. Or there's something we know God said to do, but we're like, well, people don't do that anymore. They're not doing that anymore. They, that's not how they do it. And so whenever we're thinking these thoughts, we start hedging on what we know to be the truth and what we know to be right. And the moment we start hedging, compromise is at the door. Now, all of those things that we say to ourselves indicate a change in our perspective about things and may even indicate a change in our preference and preferences. But neither our perspective nor our preference alters principle. So if God said something, oh, you don't hear me this morning. If God said something, he meant it. And if he said it, that's it. That settles it. You don't rationalize thou shalt not. You can't rationalize a commandment, right? You can't sit there and evolve over truth. <laughs> it's either truth or it's not. If I'm evolving, then that's just me evolving into my own rationalization. But the truth itself does not change does not change. So Aaron should have stood up and said to the children of Israel, you know, I know how you guys feel. I know what you're used to. I know what you're seeing. I know what you know. But uh, we're not changing on this. The, the, the God that brought you out is the God we're going to worship, and it's not a calf. 
Amen? And we need to say that same thing today in our present culture of compromise. We need to let people know, know the God that brought us out is Jehovah God. It's not econ economics. It's not the government. It's not politicians. It's not parties. It's not any of those. So we don't bow down and worship that now. We don't worship at the throne of public opinion and consensus. It is the God Jehovah that has saved us and not we ourselves. So that's who we hold true to because we live in this age of compromise. We live in this age now where there's a spirit of compromise, a spirit of, in, in that we are always questioning where we stand on things even though God has already said where we should stand. And so instead of being compromisers and bowing to the fear of man, we should take upon ourselves the disposition of the three Hebrew boys. You remember the three Hebrew boys, don't you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Pastor Iron. You remember them, don't you? You, <laughs> you remember them, don't you? you? They were faced with an entire nation bowing to the music of a king. So here was the pressure of the fear of man upon these three little boys. But instead of caving like Peter and caving like Aaron, they chose to stand tall in the truth they knew. And guess what they taught us? They taught us if you don't bow, you won't burn. Ah, See, they taught us that it's not in compromise that you are protected, but it's in standing that you are protected. You see, when you believe that you can keep yourself, you compromise. But when you're trusting Jehovah to keep you, you stand. So they teach us if I don't bow, I won't burn Daniel in the lion's den. You remember Daniel, don't you? Thrown in the lion's den. Thrown to the lions to be consumed because Daniel would not bow. He would not compromise. He would not bend. And once again, we see this principle emerge where if I don't compromise, I can't be eaten. I can't be devoured. I can't be destroyed. So it seems as though the children of God should learn to have some boldness. Because evidently, that's where the blessing is. That's where the grace is, to stand your ground. Hallelujah. We're living in times where we are being pressed by the fear of men, the consensus of opinion, the swirling of narratives, all of these things surrounding the church to get the church to cave to get the church to fold, to get the church to stay at home, to get you not to press on forward in your worship and your loyalty to the God who saved you. But I'm looking for some three Hebrew boys this morning. I'm looking for some Daniels this morning who have another spirit that says no matter what the culture is saying, I know the God who saved me, and he is the one who deserves my loyalty and my faithfulness. So I won't be moved by what I see. I won't be moved by what I feel. I won't be moved by what they say. I'm going to stand on what he has said and who he is to me. And there is blessing there. There, there is absolute blessing when we stand. I tell you, in this nation, we're watching preachers cave compromise, give in, because the fear of man has brought this snare of compromise. We're watching people in every walk of life give in to the pressure because they think in giving in, they're preserving themselves. They're keeping themselves. They're into this uh, survival mode. Well, I'm, I'm trying to survive the times. Well, you don't survive the times with compromise. You survive the times with boldness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Good, good, good. 
I'm telling you, you're going to look up and you're going to find that all of us who have been laughed at during this time are going to be the people that are being sought out in a later time because we stood our ground on the Word of God. See it in the Scripture, child of God. See it in the Word. When you stand, you are blessed. God protects and keeps the bold. He upholds the bold and courageous. He does not protect the coward. No, no. No, no. There is no grace for the runner. <laughs> There's grace for the stander. You got to hear me this morning. God is calling his church to a place of boldness. He's calling us to a place of standing. And if we don't learn to deal with this fear of man, we're going to miss out on his grace. Yeah. Let me show you something. There's another aspect of compromise that we have to deal with here as children of God that uh, is very significant to us as individuals. Not only should we not compromise morally or where truth is concerned or where God's word is concerned, but we should not compromise our calling either. The Holy Spirit last night in prayer while I was praying before this message, uh, in, in a time of prayer, the Holy Spirit spoke this, this, this word to me in prayer time. He said that there is no grace to play smaller than you're called to be. Man, that was so powerful to me last night. There is no grace to play smaller than than you're called to be. So whatever God's called you to be and who God's called, what God's called you to do, who he's called you to be, you don't get any brownie points by playing small. A lot of people think if they, uh, well, no, not me. Uh, no, I just, uh, uh, and they just back up off of everything God called them to do and everything God called them to be. They think they're being humble. But you're not being humble. It's false humility, which is pride. Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> pride is false humility. False humility is pride. You're trying to preserve yourself for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know why you're shrinking back from who God's called you to be and what he's called you to do. Because there's no grace to play small. You have to fully embrace who God's called you to be. Oh, you got to hear me. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Go to Jeremiah 1, 6, 7. You, you have to embrace who he's called you to be. There is no grace for you to shrink back. Here we find Jeremiah where God's called him from your mother's womb. I knew you. I've anointed you. I've, I've ordained you. I've set you over the nations to pluck up, to root out, to tear down, to build, to plant. He's got this entire word. But look at Jeremiah's response in verse 6 and 7. He says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, you shall speak. Now look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah hears this great word, this great promise of who he is and what he's to do, and the first thing out of his mouth is a disqualifier. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I can't do that because I'm a child. Now, some of us do the same thing. We're not children, but we say, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I don't know anybody. Right. Oh, Lord, I can't do that. You know my past? Yeah. Yes, he does know your past. <laughs> oh, God, I can't do that because of my age. Some people say I can't do that because I'm too young. Some people say I can't do it because I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. Lord, I can't do that. And you shrink back. You compromise. The calling that's on your life. I don't know enough people. I've never been to school. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. None of that matters when he calls you. None of that matters when he calls your name and he equips you to do something. And God says the same thing to you that he says to Jeremiah. Don't tell me you're a child. 
Don't say you're too weak. Don't say you don't know enough. You're going to do exactly what I called you to do, but you're going to do it in my ability. You see, that's why God doesn't need you to know everything, have everything, because what you're going to do for him, he's going to do it through you in his ability. And the reason we compromise is because we're always thinking about our ability. Our ability. What I can do. What I know how to do. Who I know. What I can understand. But God's plan for you is much bigger than your ability. Oh, you might want to write this down and, forget, and never forget this. Whatever God called you to do, you will not be able to do without his ability. If you can do it, he didn't say it. If you can accomplish it in your own might, he didn't say it. Because when God calls us, you go throughout Scripture, there is not a character in Scripture you have seen that did not have to depend upon God's ability to get their job done. So when he calls you, he equips you. But we get into compromise because we start thinking about the limitations of our own strength and our own ability. And so neither are we to not only compromise on truth, but we can't compromise on the call, who God's called me to be, what he's called me to do. It's time for you all in here to embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace it. If God has called you to do business, do business. Don't sit there and go, well, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know who and what. Do business. If he's called you to ministry, embrace the calling to ministry. Because there is no grace for you to shrink back. See, there's no grace for you to play small ball. There's no grace for you to be deflecting, say, oh, no, not me. No, no, there's no grace for that. You've got to stand in the pocket. You've got to actually do what he's called you to do. That's where you find the power to accomplish your calling. The number two snare, we're already on point number two, look at that. The number two snare that emerges from the fear of man, if it's not compromise, is comparison. Comparison. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If Satan cannot use compromise to cripple you, he will then move to comparison through the fear of man. I can't get you to stop. I can't get you to compromise. Let me see if I can get you into comparison with others and get you into that trap. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse number 12, the Apostle Paul is dealing with a bit of uh, persecution, if you would, because there are those that are talking about Paul and trying to poison the reputation of Paul to the church of Corinth. And Paul gets wind of this, and he addresses it in this chapter. Verse number 12 says, he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. He said, there's a whole bunch of people running, walking around here recommending themselves. <laughs> he says, but they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are idiots. <laughs> he said they're not wise. He wasn't quite as strong as I was. But we will not boast of things without our measure. Underline that, our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. He says, so Corinth, you're within our measure. We're called to reach you. We were anointed and sent to you. He says, for we stretch not ourselves, verse 14, beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Now, here is the apostle Paul modeling to us the type of attitude you've got to have when it comes to the temptation to get into comparison. <clears throat> because what they're trying to draw 
Paul into is a bit of a war, a bit of a comparison, a bit of a measuring war, and, 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 and begin to measure himself next to these others who are recommending themselves. There's always people who recommend themselves. Yeah, there's a whole lot of people who like wandering into things that they are not even called to be in. <laughs> and, and they're trying to tempt Paul into this, but Paul does not take the bait. Paul says, I'm not going to compare myself with all of you people recommending yourselves. Why? Because I know my measure. I know my lane. I know what has been distributed to me. Say this. Say, there are things that have been distributed to you. There are things that belong to you. There are things that are yours. There is your measure. When it comes to what God's called you to do, there is a measure given to you. You've got to know what that is. Because if you don't know that you know that you know what that is, the fear of man will cause you to get into comparison. Because you don't know what's yours, you become insecure, vulnerable. You feel the need and the temptation to compare yourself with everything around you because you don't know who you are and what you have. You don't know what's distributed to you. And so the Apostle Paul says, I know it's mine. I even know that you at Corinth are mine. <laughs> he says, so I'm not going to get into this little measuring contest with these people because I know what I've been given. Do you know what you've been given? Do you know who you're called to be? Do you know what God has distributed to you? Because what he's given you is yours. And you have to learn to be secure in what he's given you so that you don't fall prey to comparing yourself with everybody else around you. Can I give you a, a golden nugget of a, of a principle for life? It's found in Proverbs 4 and 26. One verse of scripture. I love this verse of scripture. It says, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do you know what that's saying in that old English translated out of the Hebrew? Mind your business. <laughs> it's saying, mind your business. Not talking about just minding your business, not gossiping and not talking about others. That's one aspect. That's moral. But no, Put your mind on your business. Your measure should be what's on your mind. Learn to focus on what has been given to you and ponder the path of your feet. What's my path? What's my path? What's my path? I know this as a pastor and as a preacher of the gospel, and I've been preaching for many years, watching ministry, watching preachers, watching ministries all the time. There is a temptation to wander off your path and follow after paradigms. You know what a paradigm is, right? It's a way of doing things. It's a pattern. It's this is how we do it now. We do it this way. And when there's a way to do something, we tend to find temptation if we feel like on our path, we're not progressing as fast as we'd like to progress. But can I tell you, your path is so unique. God doesn't duplicate paths. Your path is as unique as his instruction to you. There are people in this room, God is telling you to do A. 
Then there are people in this room he's telling to do B. Then there are others who are hearing C. And we could cover the whole alphabet. And your obedience to that instruction determines your path. Now your path, you're not hearing what I'm hearing. You're not hearing what I'm hearing. I'm not hearing what you're hearing. Therefore, how could we ever compare ourselves to each other? You see, that's why it's a trap. Because, see, you honestly cannot compare an apple to an orange. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't do it. They're two different fruit. And you cannot compare two purposes, two plans, two paths from our God. Because your path will take turns that my path will not. And we get into trouble because we start looking around and we start comparing ourselves with each other and comparing ourselves to this and to that and all these different things. And we forfeit our path <clears throat> because on our path, we haven't gotten to the good part yet. You know, you can get out here and you can drive. Uh, you, you can take certain routes. You, you have heard the phrase, take the scenic route. Right? So there are certain ways to get to a particular destination where you can take you can take one path and it's country and it's fields and it's nothing. You can take another path and you can drive through the city and you can see the skyline and all the sights and the beautiful place. And, and, and everybody, <laughs> everybody compares their paths. Everybody says, well, your path is more scenic. There's more stuff to see. But that doesn't mean that path is moving any faster than yours. Do you know the Bible says something very interesting? I don't have time to get off into it. I think it's Exodus. Uh, I think it's further along in Exodus 32. <clears throat> but the Bible says that God led the children of Israel by the way of the Philistines. Uh, uh, not by the way of the Philistines, but by the way of the desert, though the way of the Philistines was closer. Meaning, if he, if he took them through the way of the Philistines, it would have been a much shorter trip. But the Bible says he led them around through the wilderness. He said, lest they should see war and repent in their mind and go back. So God took into account the fragility of their mind before he led them out. You missed it. You missed it. God chose a path that wouldn't scare them to death. And he does the same thing with you and me. See, you're angry at God over a path that he chose because of you. <laughs> yeah. It's going that slow because of you, not him. He knows you. So he chose your way based upon your own disposition. He says, I know, my God, if I, take them the way, if I take them the fast way, they will not make it. They will not make it. They will have destroyed themselves and their family. So I'm going to take them this way. Amen. <clears throat> so we find ourselves upset because the Father begins to lead us according to sometimes our proclivities and our issues. He's trying to lead us in a way that gets us to where he promised. We have to learn to choose paths over paradigms. What God has called you to do, you've got to choose that over anything you see going on in the culture around you. Why? Because your time is for your path. God gave you time for the path he called you to walk. So I can't use my time to walk somebody else's path because that's a waste of time. Because my time is for my path. And if I stay obedient, I will have plenty of time to do what he called me to do. Did you hear what I just said? If I'm obedient, I will have plenty of time to do whatever I'm called to do. Because my time is for my path. So we find that we need to ponder the path of our feet, mind our own business, do what God has put in our hearts to do and not be stolen from by comparison. Because comparison steals our peace, it steals joy, it steals confidence. 
It steals our time. I was talking to an entrepreneur just this week who started his own uh, business and everything, and he's doing actually quite well in his business. And sometimes we actually will have discussions about things from time to time. I like talking to him. He likes talking to me. And we were talking about being an entrepreneur, and he always talks about how people have a distorted perception of what it means to be an entrepreneur. He says, because people think uh, they, they turn on television or they turn on YouTube and they see somebody talking about, do you want to be able to take back your time, do your own thing and travel the world? <laughs> do, you, do, you want to, do you want to just stay a slave to that job and work nine to five? He says, and they hear that and they don't understand that when you become an entrepreneur, you go from working nine to five to working 24-7. Yeah. He said, an entrepreneur, life is not this he said, you have to work your way toward that freedom, but it may not come as quickly as you think. And he said, and a lot of times people sit back, and this is so powerful and profound. Oh, man, this is so good. Hear this, what he said. He said, so many people look at other people functioning in their gift and think they can duplicate what somebody is doing in their gift, and they can't. You can't. You can't duplicate a gift. You can't duplicate or reproduce what somebody is doing by divine gift. So if you're ever comparing yourself to a gift, you are going to be sorely disappointed and end up depressed because you can never reproduce on the level of a gift. That's their gift. So what you've got to do is find yours. And he said so many people do that, and they look at somebody who's an entrepreneur, and they have a gift to be an entrepreneur, and they're doing it, and they compare themselves to that, thinking they can reproduce it, and they get out there, and they fall flat on their face, and they can't do it. He said, because you've got to always ask yourself the question, are you truly built for this? Are you built for that life? You've got to know that in your art. What are you built for? Because when you know what you're built for, you will, you will go a long way in keeping down this snare of compromise and, and comparison. You won't be comparing yourself to other people. You can see that in the natural world. You can see that right now. A lot of people were talking about this, and I bring this up because we just got through watching the NBA Finals, and people were talking about Steph Curry. Everybody give it up for Steph. Everybody thank God for Steph. I, I, I'm a Steph fan. Amen. He ain't Jesus, but I just say give it up for Steph. I'm a Steph Curry fan. And it's said about Steph Curry, he's messing up the game. Now, they said that jokingly. They, they didn't mean it like he was messing up the game for real. But what they were saying is now they got kids on every level running around taking shots 30 feet out at half court. <laughs> People trying to take shots from 27, 30 feet from the basket. People running down on fast breaks to the free throw line, I mean to the three-point line, not to make a layup. Back in the day, they, they tried to make a layup at the rim. But since Steph Curry now, everybody run into the arc, trying to shoot the three. And he said it's messing up the game because what are they trying to do? They're trying to duplicate a gift. They're trying to duplicate something that is divine in its nature. So when they run to the free throw line and they try to shoot like Steph, they miss it. <laughs> because for Steph, the shot is a good shot. Because he's gifted. But for everybody else, it's not a good shot. But when we're stuck in comparison, and we don't know who we are, and we struggle to accept who we are, we live our lives taking bad shots because we saw somebody else make them. So, we can either live our lives this way. We can either live it by what God said or what we see others do. There is no blessing to copy what others do. And when you move into comparison, it gives birth to something that's far more sinister and far more destructive that we need to talk about here. And this is my last point, and we'll close it up after this. But comparison, when left unchecked, always leads to the ugly sin of envy. Envy. 
Find Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4. <clears throat> Genesis 4 gives us the story of Cain and Abel. And this, this story is important to us because it's going to show us something about envy that we need to see. It says in verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very angry or wroth or had wrath, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you wroth or why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, if you do what's right, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Mm. In other words, you have to master that desire. Notice God says to Cain, why is your countenance fallen? Because if you would do what's right, will you not be accepted as well? A lot of times when we read this verse of Scripture, we think that God had respect of Abel's offering because it was a lamb. That would be unjust. That would be an unjust God. It would be unjust for God to accept Abel's lamb just because it was a lamb and not accept Cain's fruit because Cain was a farmer. That's what he was. He was an agriculturalist. So he had what he had. So God was not uh, disqualifying Cain's offering because it wasn't a lamb because what he had was his fruit. He didn't do what was right. Notice the scripture says, in the process of time, Cain brought the fruit of the ground as an offering unto the Lord. But when Abel brought his, he brought the first of his flock and the fat thereof. Abel went through his flock and looked for the best he could find. He looked for the top, the best he could find to bring to God. Cain just brought the harvest of his crop. Old moldy cabbage, <laughs> worm eating apples. <laughs> he, just brought the, he just brought the fruit of his crop, set it up on the altar. So you see, Abel put more thought, more intent, more honor in his gift. And this is why. And God says to him, he says, look, you didn't have to bring me a lamb, but if you would have just done what was right, if you would have just went through your crop and said, I'm going to find the best tomatoes, I'm going to find the top apples, I'm going to find the best bananas, I'm going to find the best cabbage, I'm going to get the best greens, because I'm taking this to God. I'm taking this to God. And I'm, because I'm taking this to God, I'm going to find the best I can find. If he had done that, God said, you would have been accepted too. So it wasn't what you brought, it's how you brought it. And so in the process of this, Cain becomes envious of Abel. And he slays his brother. Out of his envy. Now turn to 1 John chapter 3 because it makes it plain in 1 John 3. 1 John 3 and verse number 11 says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him, or why did he kill him? He's about to answer the question. The New Testament is about to answer the question of the old. Why did he kill him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So Cain slew Abel because Abel did what was right and he didn't. Hear me. This produces something we got to hear here, and this is going to be a little sober going through here, but just stay with me. 
Envy causes us to slay others over our own inadequacies. When your comparison to someone else shows up your disobedience, envy will compel you to get rid of the comparison. <laughs> so the Bible says Cain slays Abel because his deeds were evil. Envy seeks to hurt others because we know about our own shortcomings. See, we know we're lazy. We know we're disobedient. We know we didn't do what we were supposed to do with what God said. And so when someone else who does gets the reward, we become envious of that because of our own deeds. Now, let me, let me, let me say something to you. See, envy, envy is an is a, a ugly poison. It's a devilish thing. And it's a very uniquely devilish thing because it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear. Let me, let me ask you something. What would be the use of being envious? Let's, let's, pick, let's pick a thing. <laughs> of being envious of someone's car. Or someone's house. Or someone's clothes or appearance. What would be the use of being envious of something that there's millions of? Why, why would I be envious of your car as though it's the only one manufactured? The only reason why I would be envious of something that is open for me to have is if I believe I will never have it. So because I believe I am stuck, I get mad that you're moving. <laughs> so my envy is coming from a place of being paralyzed in fear and poor esteem over my ability to accomplish the same thing. That's the only reason why. That there is no other reason why I should be envious of anything anywhere else that's going on around me unless I myself feel inadequate that I will never, ever achieve it. Is this, how, how many cars? It's probably of the same kind of car. There's multiplied hundreds of thousands. The same kind of houses. I mean, they, they got blueprints better than the house you envious of. <laughs> they got the same clothes. You can go to the same store, get the same jacket off the rack. But you don't believe. You see what I mean by I said it, it's born in fear. It's based in fear. You don't think you will ever achieve. Because the believer and the confident, the bold, the courageous, those who believe and know who they are, are never envious. I'm not after anything you got. I don't covet anything anybody has because I believe in a God who will withhold no good thing from me if I walk up rightly. So I ain't mad about you and your stuff. I don't care about your stuff. Thank God for you. I'll celebrate it for you. I'll celebrate you. I'll celebrate your promotion. I'll celebrate your things. I'll celebrate it. Why? Because I know who I am and I know what I have in him. But when envy is given a place in our hearts, that's not how we think because it gets really deep-rooted. And so the only way to deal with it, if I'm envious, is I've got to deal with this directly or indirectly. 
I, I, I've got to get rid of the thing that's making me feel less than. So this is what Cain does. As long as Abel's alive, he's going to feel small. <laughs> as long as Abel is alive, he's going to always feel small. So his envy moves him to take his brother's life, to get rid of the thing that reminds me of my smallness, to get rid of the thing that reminds me of I'm stuck. And he does that out of envy. Now, I pray nobody <laughs> has envy in their heart <laughs> to that degree. But we've seen it. You ladies know all about it. You watch Lifetime. All them shows based on some type of envy. I've never seen it. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, 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 it's crazy. There's, there's crazy women out there. Just eek, eek, eek. Just like, what in the world? But all of that stuff is based on envy and jealousy. And there's always some storyline around envy and jealousy. But I hope nobody's like that. And so... Let's, let's get past that. Let's, let's look at envy in a different light because, see, this is going to set us free because these things, these things hold up our blessings. See, these are little foxes that eat at the vine. So if I can't get rid of the thing that I'm comparing myself to that makes me small in a direct fashion, I do it indirectly. Let's say you're in the office. And there's an employee, a coworker, that's always excelling. They're always doing their job. They're there early. They stay late. They're getting promotions. They're doing well. And their well-doing just don't make you feel, it makes you feel some kind of way. Because it's like they're the teacher's pet. And I'm talking about it being right. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the buddy-buddy system. I'm talking about somebody actually doing what they need to do. And they're working hard and they're doing their job. And so instead of attacking the person directly, you start snaking through the office. And I do say snaking. You start slithering through the office because now if I can't take the person down, I've got to change the way the person is viewed by others. That's my second thing to do. See, so, so envy moves me if I'm stuck in this, this trap of comparison, and it, and it grows up into envy. So now envy says, I've got to now find a way to stop people from seeing them in a positive light. I've got to affect the way other people see them since I can't take them down directly. We've seen this in church. We see it in ministry. You know, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. I've heard countless horror, horror stories of pastors. Now, who should have the most influence in the church? The pastor. He's up there preaching. Now, Jesus, of course, is the top. But Jesus put the pastor there, hopefully. <laughs> Prayerfully, Jesus put the pastor so the pastor should have influence. But there are people who will sit in churches, and they don't want to see the pastor with the influence. So since they can't move the pastor out of the position, they start snaking through the congregation. And they have to poison the perception of the pastor in the congregation. We've got to change the way the congregation sees him. Because we can't move him, but we can move the people. We can't get rid of him, but we can maybe get rid of his reputation in the mind of the people. And so people use these tactics throughout life, even in families. They'll snake through the family, trying to poison the whole family against a successful member. Well, you know, they got their new house over there they just built. But I happen to know, you know, they, they, they ain't the happiest, you know. They're just, you know. yeah, they look like they're happy, but I, I know the truth. See, I understand. And so they start snaking through the family to try and corrupt the perception. J 
just like God told Cain, sin is at the door. Sin is at the door. And all of this, and here's what I'm, I'm saying all this to say one thing. All of this grows out of the soil of the fear of man. Too much anxious concern about people. Too much anxiety over people. And so we get the snare of compromise. And if we break out of the snare of compromise, then comes the snare of comparison. Comparison grows up into envy, and envy leads to the attempt to destroy and assassinate characters. Now, the Bible says, to finish out that verse in Proverbs 29 and 25, though, if I trust God, I'm safe. When I trust God, I'm safe from all of these little snares. When I'm trusting God, I don't need to pull anybody down. I don't need to poison anybody's perception of somebody else. I don't need to compromise. I can stand my ground on the truth. I don't need none of that because I believe God. You like that? In Jeremiah 17, where it says, you're like that tree planted by the rivers of water. You ain't, even got, you ain't even worried about whether the sun come out. You ain't even worried about whether it rains or not. You don't even care about natural circumstances or issues because you found a source that will not run dry. You found the source. This is what trusting God gives you. It gives you freedom from the fear of man. There are churches businesses, families, marriages, individual lives that are stuck in these snares. And they're having a hard time getting out because they don't know what they're dealing with. They think, oh, it's just people and we just deal with people. You deal with people all the time. No, it's that we're walking around here with so much fear of man. We can't walk in the favor and the blessing of God. We can't walk in the things of God because we got comparison going on. We're measuring ourselves and we're fussing about this and we're fussing about that. And, and God knows nowadays you add politics to it, people mad about everything. And then it's hot outside. And then gas is high. Milk is high. Bread is high. So you, you, you put all of this stuff in the pot and people are just ticked. <laughs> people have issues, have problems. But all of it grows out of the soil of the fear of man, which is opposite of faith in God. Say this with me. Close your eyes right where you're sitting. Put your hand on your chest. Say, I trust God. I trust God. I believe God. He takes care of me. He is my God. He is my Father. I have no reason to fear, to panic, or to carry anxiety. He watches over me, and he that watches over me never slumbers, never sleeps. He never dozes. He never nods. He's always watching over me to keep me, to protect me, to provide for me, to lead me in paths of righteousness. Father, thank you. I declare. I am free from the fear of man. I will not worry what man can do unto me, for you are my God, and my faith is in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet. Oh, we've got to give. <laughs> We're going to give on the way out the door, okay? Okay. God is so faithful. He's so faithful to give a word like this. Because some of you, some of you are standing at the threshold of a new day for yourself. New beginnings, new endeavors. 
Some of you are standing at the beginning of, of greater works and greater that God has planned for your life. But while you're standing at that threshold, many of you, you're kind of stuck there because your mind is on people. Your mind is on, yeah, but I don't know this, I don't know that. What about this? What about that? And, and you've got all of this stuff on your mind and you, you're, you're refusing to go ahead and step through that door. Whatever that door is, maybe it's ministry, maybe it's greater ministry, maybe it's in business, maybe it's financially, maybe it's in your own family. Maybe it's some changes you want to you make, some things you want to do, some different changes you need to make in your life to take a different direction and start something that you, you, you've been going down a certain path all this time, but you, you, you feel like God's leading you to change direction and do something different. And you're standing there and you're wondering, you know, but what, what about people and what will this and what will that? And you're all tangled up with that. But it's time for you to get through this threshold. See, this is why God gives a word like this, because he knows where you are. He sees you. And so the way in which he answers every issue is with his word. So he arrested me a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night. I was going to preach something else. <laughs> they said, no, I want you to take some time and I want you to teach on the fear of man because there are, there are people who are dealing with this and they can't get beyond it. They need to get beyond it. So if you're in this place today, I'm just going to ask you right where you are. <clears throat> Head bowed, eye closed. We're not going to get out of our seats. If this word was directly to you and for you, let me know just by lifting your hand. That's all. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Praise God. Absolutely. You can let you put your hand down now. So that lets me know you're confirming God is speaking to you. All you have to do is make a decision. And yeah, you might, you might do it with your knees knocking. <laughs> you might do it a little with some fear and some trembling. You might do it, man, second-guessing yourself. You might do it with all of that in your head and in your mind. But trust God. Remember what I said. It's the bold that are kept and provided for and protected. It's not the fearful. It's not the faint of heart. Go boldly into that new thing God has for you. Go boldly into it. Don't second guess his word. Don't second guess his guidance, his leading. Go boldly into it without any compromise. And you watch him catch you. It may feel like you're stepping off of a cliff. <laughs> it, may, it, may feel like, it may feel like, God, I'm going to do it. I don't know what. But you go ahead and step. Watch him catch you. Watch him bear you up in his hands. And your feet are not going to dash against the stone. He's going to keep you. He's going to hold you. He's going to catch you. And you're going to look up and you're going to say, thank God I was bold enough to step. Thank God I did it. Thank God I stepped. Thank God I went through that door. Because whatever you compromise to try and keep, you're going to eventually lose anyway. Might as well go through that door. Go through that door, child of God. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice, both present and watching today by live stream. Give us the boldness and courage. Your word declares we can pray for boldness, and we pray for boldness today. I speak over every person under the sound of my voice to have the boldness and the courage to step forward and step out in what you're calling them to do. Father, we thank you that your word declares that we are not to cast away our confidence because it carries a great recompense of reward, that you will compensate the confident. You will compensate the bold who step out on your word and on your command. And it's in Jesus' name that I thank you for it. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Praise God. Did you get anything out of this word today? I believe it. I believe it. <clears throat> if you're in this place this morning, we're going to have the ministers go ahead and come up if you would. We're going to give on our way out the door. Don't worry, we're going to do that. But I want the ministers to go ahead and come forward at this time. Come on up. If you're in this place and you say, I have prayer needs, I'm going to give you three cat two categories. I have prayer needs, or three, I'm sorry, two cat three categories. If you have prayer needs that were not covered in this message or you feel like, I just need somebody to touch and agree with me about some particular things in my life that are going on. These ministers exist on this altar to do just that. They will pray with you and pray for you and lead you uh, as, as God puts on their heart to pray with you over whatever it is you may need. Number two, 
If you're in this place and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, what are you waiting on? <laughs> the greatest thing you ever did is accept the free gift of salvation. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is he does not require of you anything to be saved. To be saved. Because it's a free gift. You just accept it. And he'll work out your sanctification after you accept it, but you accept him freely because he loves you just that much. And so if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when we get ready to dismiss and we get ready to give and leave this place, I'm going to ask for you to come forward, and these ministers are here to pray with you. Also, and third and finally, if you do not have a church home and you're in this place and you would love to have a church family, it is a place you call home, a pastor you call your pastor, and you don't have one, I would be honored and humbled to be your pastor. And so if you're in this place and you fall into that category, when we dismiss, you can come forward and see this lady to my left. This is Tiffany Bonner, and she will get you connected to our new member Connect class and get you into the household of faith here at Christ Nations. God bless you all. We love you. As we get ready to give on the way out the door, we're going to come forward and bring our gifts. Go ahead and, and put those out on the steps. We're going to bring our gifts, and then you can be dismissed. And I want you to take this word with you all week. When you go back to work, when you go back to wherever you're going, when you're dealing with people, think about it. Think about it. Do I trust man or do I fear man or do I trust God? Do I trust God? I believe you're going to trust God. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for every gift given this morning. We thank you for everyone bringing both tithes and offerings and gifts of love. And as they sow and bring their gifts into the household of faith, we thank you for the corresponding return upon every gift given. For your word declares that when we give in obedience, it is given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over Do you cause men to give into our bosom. And Father, we are thankful for the law of sowing and reaping that you have given unto your children to live by. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. We will see you on Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible study. For those who will not be here for Wednesday night, we will see you next Sunday morning. Go in the peace of God. Hi, I'm Star Petrie. On behalf of the entire Christ Nations Church family, we want to thank you for joining us today. We pray that the Word of God strengthened you, encouraged you, maybe even convicted you a little bit. And if so, we'd ask that you share this gospel message. Help us to take the Word of God around the globe. And in partnering with us, we know that there will be a fruitful return on everything that we do, every seed sown for the kingdom. And so thank you so much for joining us. Consider joining us again. And in the meantime, remember that one word from God can change your life forever.